um, I want to thank the moderator of this panel. Um, I've failed already today. Um, this is my next wedding in Camden Town. Um, so I can't add a few today for the wedding. So excuse me, maybe seven days. Uh, I'm traveling with the way to see from Bob 76 that helps companies exit both money in the digital space. Uh, I also write a uh, week to publish the Telegraph uh, and contribute regularly to the National Tech Crunch and Wired uh, and as the allegedly higher end uh, economist uh, BBC uh, and MIT Tech Review. Um, my interest in Africa has mushroomed over the last couple of years. Um, before in 2008, I went to India with my wife and five year old son uh, to, get away from, uh, to get away from London. Uh, the mobile games company that I was involved in, uh, we failed with Angry Birds. Um, so that just shows you why I went to India. Um, so I went there, I went for two years, and became a kind of Bollywood villain in a couple of movies, and decided to come back to the UK uh, and with the idea to go to uh, seeing a uh, German in South Africa for the World Cup. Flew to Addis Ababa, got very sick, uh, ill, and decided not to go to the football, but they on this mad mission uh, for Ethiopia. Uh, in the Highlands and into the Somali lands and had an amazing full ex experience and effectively fell in love with Africa so that's if I come home in terms of potential but that's how it is. The two people that will be on the panel are um, Peter Eric Banks, which is Eric Hutchman and Ken Banks. Uh, Eric Hutchman is the co-founder of Ushahidi, which is a citizen uh, journalism platform that was believed to up to the Kenyan public troubles a couple of years ago. Uh, it's now pivoted into the United Extraordinary Business from one of the most amazing companies in Africa. And Eric Kirshner comes more from the kind of side of um, you know, the, the whole uh, title is called the source of the environments, and he probably knows more than anyone else about that. So I'll pass it over to them, uh, they can introduce themselves, and hopefully we can get a discussion going and take it. Thank you very much. Lovely place, right? I actually really like that last session because um, I was excited by the end. And, um, you know, in, in my world where I'm in, I, I, I come from Africa, I grew up in Sudan and Kenya, and I still work there. Um, it's kind of this mixture of, of like, we call it like push punk stuff. You used to get like a graphic that just kind of clutched together technology and local materials, as well as, you know, something that you see from Firefly. So that's how I envision the future in Africa. But um, what I do is I deal with stuff uh, like this. So Ushi uh started in 2008. Uh, it's an organization that builds software, it's a non-profit tech company, uh, for use in kind of crisis and disaster zones globally. Uh, it's now in 159 countries, uh, 50,000 economies of it, and it's used for every major thing from you know, Haiti to, uh, to Japan to you know, elections in Kenya. Um, we also built this other place called the iHub. The iHub is a space in Nairobi that houses about 11,000 um, tech entrepreneurs and people who work in corporates. And it's really that kind of cross section of the tech community in Kenya that calls it home. And then our most recent product is called the Brick, which is a, which is a hardware device. I brought one of the prototypes here with me. Uh, and we're, we're, we're shipping these in November. And it's really about connectivity when you're in our part of the world. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a really great quote um, by Theodore Roosevelt, which says, do what you can with what you have where you are. And I think that's a lot about what we, what we do when we're solving problems in Kenya. We're not looking at the flashiest new fact. We're using the old stuff. There's nothing new about a motor, a router, and a tablet. But the way we put them together is There's nothing new about creating a mashup for uh, crowdsourcing information. It wasn't new when we did it in 2008. It was four years old by then. But nobody had that use case yet. And so I think that's what's interesting, and that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about today, is the idea that you can actually take old technology, use it and abuse it, and uh, come up with really interesting solutions that have a much lower common denominator and spread across the world. And with that, I'll hand it over So I'm going to be quick. I'm going to make a few, a few points because I'd rather we dive in and actually have a little conversation around this stuff because it's, it's pretty fascinating and a lot of interest obviously in this area. Predominantly because I think people are now seeing it as a, as a market that could be tapped into and lots of money made. Uh, if you call developing countries, emerging markets, 
people see it very differently um, and they work those things. Uh, I thought to quickly um, say that the economists had an article about a week or two ago, um, and in that article they said that discontented people innovate. And I think you also probably say that disconnected people innovate. So if you have everything that you need at your fingertips, you have 3G, iPhone, smartphone, iPad, tablet, power, cash machine, in every corner, all those wonderful things that we have, say in the UK, where they could argue that 3G, 4G might not be quite as good as we'd like, then there's less need to innovate because we're <coughs> really happy almost in the sense that we've got everything that we need. And the reason that Kenya is leading the world with our money um, it's not just because Kenya happens to be a really cool place and great tech stuff going on right now, but it's predominantly because there's not a cash machine on every corner, and there's not online banking that people can actually get to. There aren't even banks in most places. So it's that scarcity which, which is the key, really. So scarcity is not actually a hindrance. I think sometimes people see scarcity as a hindrance and it's, oh well, we better not really do anything there because it's going to be too difficult. Um, most innovation does come from places of to suffer from scarcity. Um, I see constraints as a positive thing as well. Uh, I don't think it's a problem at all. I don't want to actually work in a world which is full of 3G, 4G, iPads, connectivity, power. I think that's boring. If you tell me you can do anything you want with all this kit, there's no boundary, that's not, for me, particularly exciting. But if you say to me that the people in this community have only got nine-year-old Nokia phones with monochrome screens, they can do text messaging and voice calls, and that's it. And these communities happen to be facing some of the biggest challenges that people are facing on the planet. That's my kind of challenge. Right? Now, SMS is old. I spent the last eight years working in, in text messaging and SMS. And I think through frontline SMS, we're still proving that you can actually do really quite cool and interesting things with SMS. And in itself, a text message is a constraint. It's 160 characters. You really can't do anything you want in that. You have to be very, very creative. It's very, very valuable space. And again, that for me is, is why this is such an interesting area. Um, I'll just sort of leave on the point of appropriate technology. Something I, I studied a lot at Sussex University in 1996 and became a really big fan of. And the appropriate technology movement really grew out of, out of you know, farming implements and plows and cook stones in the sort of 70s. But you can really apply a lot of the learnings from appropriate technology and Fritz Schumacher's work today in that things that you build need to be able to be locally owned. They need to be appropriate to <coughs> the environments in which they're being used. To such an Eric's point, you need to actually build for the things that people have in their hands. And if they break, can people fix them locally? Can they actually pull them apart and rebuild them? Or do you have to fly in 10 consultants from Washington DC or London to figure it out? Those are really big issues, and if we build to actually avoid those things happening, then the, really the, the, the sky is, is the limit. And that's really all I want to say. I think it'd be great to have a conversation around all this stuff. And one final thing I'll say is that when I, unlike Eric, who grew up in Africa and kind of grew up in this constrained environment, I grew up in Jersey and Channel Islands, which was a pretty wealthy place once when the banking industry was doing pretty well. And I didn't grow up in that, in that environment. I'm an outsider. I went to Africa in 1993, the first got a real personal experience of how challenging and difficult life was for many of the people living in these areas and realised the fact that life actually sucks for most people on the planet. We're just very, very lucky. So I'm an outsider, but I think today there's less and less need for people like me. I think I was maybe needed 10 years ago or 20 years ago. We might touch on this again in our chat, but I think today there's less and less need because of places like the IHOP, which are enabling Kenyans and Africans and people in Asia and all the wealthy countries to actually start to fix their own problems which I think surely is got to be the way to go. Thanks.
about stuff going on in Africa, you're thinking about aid, right? So you think about how your money goes to BIFID or USAID or CEDA or wherever you come from in, in, in Europe or the US and goes there. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on aid versus trade? I was <laughs> when I was in Cologne, uh, a year ago, it was in Cologne, in Accra, one of those. So uh, it was a very cool London guy, and he used to run this kind of uh, concert <laughs> service for getting to the clubs in the UK, the Central. So it was a bit of a piece And he said that um, he was consistently annoyed about, you know, the kind of aid area stuff that was kind of transmuting into mobile. And you actually said that yourself, you know, if you've got um, a mobile health application or a mobile farming application makes it easier to check the price of drugs or to get your, to your crops on time. And he said it's all like, you know, like pregnant African women, you know, they want mobile health, but pregnant African women also like piano, and they also like music, and they also like content, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, uh, do you see any kind of move? I mean, I've met some amazing companies across the continent that are doing stuff like that. But you see it, is it, is it what's the kind of culture of that? Is there a kind of Defense against this less mobile health, more mobile content. Yeah, this is this is something that I like to hear Kim Lee on as well because you know Kim comes from the side where it's much more on the ICT for D space where ICT for development, right? Our mobile support development. I, I come from the business space and so we, I've had um, some run ins with people uh, around this. And I think the terminology itself is kind of paternalistic. Uh, I think that it, 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 people don't understand how much it isolates the business people in Africa. Uh, as soon as they hear that something is an ICT for D or an for D project, it's kind of put off in that pigeonhole over there and it's not taken seriously any longer. Um, and I know Pins has some changing ideas or thoughts around uh, the development space as well in, in, in business. Uh, you know, if you should talk some about it. Yeah, I think I've just got a bit more cynical after spending 11 years trying to get mobile phones to do useful things, um, mostly in Africa, because that's the place where they kept calling me back. I'm um, to Paul Pollack, who some of you may know of, who wrote the book called Design for the 90%. And his new book came out last couple of weeks. It's called The Business Solution Policy. And Paul's a real critic of, of aid money. Really, he's really very, really, very really strongly that it doesn't actually solve anything. And if you actually put yourself in the, the shoes of an African trader, you say that a little mobile phone shack, and you're selling phones, and you're maybe helping people download apps, and paying a little bit of money, and that kind of thing. And suddenly, $10 million arrives from a government aid project which totally wipes out the business because they're giving away phones or they're giving stuff away for free. Right? There's all these unintended consequences. And I think that as I've spent more and more time in the sector, I'm increasingly beginning to believe that actually we do need business solutions. Obviously, we have to create markets. We have to show businesses actually you can make money from poor people. But you have to think very, very carefully about the price points and how you develop that solution. Because once you prove there's a market, there's profits, which will then go back into your products, you'll then be in the competitive marketplace, so it's about who has the best product, one who has the most money. Because you know, there's so much money in development, it's insane, I and mean, it's almost obscene when you see the kinds of levels. And people get, get very, very excited. You know, the USA, um, the US government money around HIV, AIDS, you know, it's 15 billion. Nobody actually really bothered to think about what that was being spent on, but it sounded like such an impressive amount of money that what could possibly go wrong? Well, a lot was spent on accidents, which you know, hasn't necessarily worked in many places. So I'm beginning to think that, that I think Eric's background in business and still to this day trying to figure out how you make sustainable businesses probably is the future of development in Africa. And certainly I think the technology of development, because it's the technology side that gives you genuine opportunity to actually build a business as long as people don't come in and completely destroy the market. Do, do you think that Africa is pretty much uh, being too flippant and mobile play? Is it kind of yeah, I mean, I think there's, a, there's always, I think it's kind of funny, I think there's a valley and everyone's a while too, and it's, it's, you know, everybody's talking about mobile first, there, and I think that's kind of a new uh, phrase. And, you know, in Kenya and in other parts of Africa, it's really mobile only. Uh, and, and so when you, when you start talking about like, people, how do they interface with the internet? How do they get online and find the newest, um, you know, uh, football scores from Europe? Uh, and these are the kind of things that they're looking for too, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not looking for the credits information necessarily. Um, it's, it's that they're doing it on a small screen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and many of them will say, no, I don't want the internet on my phone, I don't want Facebook. You know, because they have, there's no um, understanding of what the difference is. So I think the small screen kind of battleground is actually really, really fascinating out there. Um, it's probably the same in, in Asia and in parts of Latin America as well. I just am not there, so I have no problem. Yeah. But tablets are making things different. I mean, 
remember a few years ago there was this massive debate debate around on laptops for trial. And everyone was saying, I don't think it's going to be using mobile phones or using laptops. And it was almost as if there was an either or. Right? Here's a laptop or here's a phone, make a choice. We don't just use one of those devices. I don't log on my phone, I don't feel the same. Sorry, everyone here is logged on the phone. Um, but you know, so there's, there's things that are really, really good to do on laptops and things that are really, really good to do on the phone. And why are we making those choices for people who don't actually understand their circumstances? Why can't they have both? Why can't someone build an affordable laptop or affordable tablet that actually allows people to make that switch? Talk about building stuff, right? You know, how about the guys in, in uh, the Congo who are, have designed their own tablet? And of course, it's being made in China, just like everything else, right? But it's you know it's just designed for them at a price point that they know they can sell within their part of the region. Uh, the you know this 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 is exactly the case, right? So a fifty dollar or hundred dollar tablet is is being made, you know, and it's already being made in Asia. So why couldn't that be sold? In? And it does. Well, I guess you've got a feature on the smartphone, uh, and the smartphone is not so great on the smartphone. So it's just a bit.
that goes off of the cost of the product, and then after a year, it becomes unlocked and it's yours to use forever. I mean, for me, that's an absolutely fantastic solution. There's increasing numbers of organizations building those kind of products. So how about a laptop, which does the same thing, right? You, you basically pay off by taxing it, it pops up your account, and it keeps the laptop alive once you paid it off. So I think there's a lot we can do, we think creatively. And so, and I, we have to finish. Um, so you were talking earlier about emerging economies. My kind of takeaway for you would be Africa's the last frontier, right? It's amazing, all types of innovation. And, it, and you talk about the emerging economies of Africa. I think it's kind of also interesting to the emerging companies of Africa. So some e-commerce companies, Lagos, Nubia, Congo, the revolutionising e-commerce by delivering stuff in the land of social services. And there are all untold amount of companies that do amazing things within that resource constraint. Uh, and you should check it out, look, look into it. We're going to fund the work we're interested in the history of the world. I'd like to thank Eric.